Yes. Hi, everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon. Yes, nice to see everyone. And uh, I'm so happy to be here today. And I'm glad that the other uh, projector is working. <laughs> yes, let's wait for others to come by. And let's see. Uh, I have an extra mic if I need it. OK. So just because uh, we're, we're running out of time, I'm going to uh, start. So uh, today I will be speaking about uh, Azure logic apps and then uh, durable functions. Who among you have worked? I know that a lot of you have worked with uh, Azure logic apps, but uh, who among you have tried Azure functions with logic apps? Yeah, that's like almost everyone. So today I will be speaking about it and uh, just share and highlight the, the purpose and the benefits of integrating uh, both of them. So when I think about integration, I actually relate it to synergy. I first heard of the word synergy when I, wrote, uh, I read a book called uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And it's one of the books that I really like because I liked the word synergy. It means that two worlds, two different things are combining their powers together in order to build something better and great. And what, this is what I see, potential, opportunity, collaboration, and flexibility. And this is the reason why we are here at Integrate uh, Conference, because we like integrating different things, either they are on-prem, on cloud, or everywhere, uh, code or with low code. Who are developers here? All, <laughs> all of us. Yes, we develop in different ways. And one of my favorite uh, quote was actually from Mar Martin Fowler. Uh, it's from his book, and you all probably have seen this. And the purpose of this code, of course, is for us to always try to write better code, not bad code. So we, as developer, should write code that we can understand. And of course, there are different ways to solve uh, a problem. And we can solve them in different ways. And for me, as a developer, also as someone working with different things around the cloud, it is important to uh, think first of how we solve the problem before we start coding in write the code. And who among you have can relate to this image? <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. I remember that I had like, I couldn't sleep because I was sitting on a bog for almost a month. And I realized I woke up and I dreamed about a solution. But not really this guy. <laughs> so this guy probably have come up with an idea while he was taking his shower. But then here on the right side, we do see uh, the importance for us developers, regardless if you're coding in different languages, the priorities that we have. The business expect us to deliver uh, what we have in our JIRA tickets, our uh, DevOps task, project board. And we all have priorities to do every sprint, regardless if it's three week sprint or a few weeks, or whatever, how long is the interval. And we do have priorities for that. And before I start bubbling more, uh, let me just introduce myself since this is my first time at Integrate speaking uh, in front of you today. Uh, I'm Jonah Anderson. I traveled from Sweden uh, here in London and to share about uh, the things that I'm passionate about. So, so you can see I have a lot of budgets and titles. I've, I'm writing my book. But what I'm here for, actually, is my purpose to inspire uh, tech to all of you and even others. But by day job, I work as a senior IT consultant with focus on uh, development uh, in Azure, uh, .NET, as well as working with cloud infrastructure and DevOps. So I have a 
pretty broad uh, experience technically wise as well as working with uh, business and different uh, teams. You can follow me on this uh, social channels and you will find me pretty active in the community and uh, the things that I do for others and other developers. So my goal today is actually You've heard a lot about Azure or Logic Ops already. I will touch point them, but I won't deep dive them to you because I know you're really good at it. But I will be focusing more on how you can use Azure durable functions for integrating with serverless uh, workflows. And I will introduce you to the different uh, orchestration patterns that you can use uh, in uh, solving different use cases as well. So benefits of low-code, no-code solutions, we all aware of that. It's like it help, help us with collaboration. It help us with delivering business value as well as enhancing the operational benefits of a lot of things. And what I love about the power or synergy between low-code, no-code, and programming languages that we have in the cloud, on-prem, and the hybrid or multi-cloud solution is it allows us, everyone, to learn together and develop together. And I'm an advocate of being inclusive to everyone, that those that are still beginning their journey in tech would be able to learn about tech in any way, low code or new languages. So serverless, uh, to those that are, uh, haven't heard it before, it's these features of abstracting uh, servers from in infrastructures and you're breaking logic into functions. It allows us to uh, integrate with event-driven apps as well as auto-scaling and as developers can focus on uh, productivity as well. I heard some Swedish, Swedish developers around. So, and today is uh, Swed the Swedish, Swed Sveriges National Dog and Swedish National Day. So, I created this version. Every time I talk about serverless, I created this serverless sweet Swedish fika uh, comparison in terms of the different um, like different technology or architecture that we have. So if you see from left to right, from left we have monolithic, I mean monolith architecture, which is like layered cake. You have everything in there, the data, the, the application, the services. But then if that cake gets broken, just like the on-prem or traditional infrastructure that we have, then everything goes down like any systems. If the database is down and it's in monolithic, then it breaks. And then today also, from left to right, we see that we have microservices. that are like cupcakes. And then we have containers, which are like box of cookies in containers. And then serverless, like logic apps or Azure functions, event-driven, you can create a function or activity that serves its purpose, like sending mail or uh, saving, saving data to a database. But the point that I have here is from left to right, the more we choose to the right side, the more we gain productivity as users or as uh, developers. And to me, and for us, it helps us solve a lot of problems. Let me just take a water. <laughs> Azure Logic Ops, uh, we heard a lot of great things happening uh, for Azure Logic Ops Arena. I really like the custom feature for .NET framework. So I did take a screenshot of that while watching this at previous session, and I'm definitely gonna uh, try it out as, uh, as a developer. But to those that are new to Azure Logic Apps, this is the overview of, of it. It allows us to 
to develop automated workflows using the, the Logic App Designer. It allows us to integrate with Azure services within Azure, as well as the uh, B2B use cases that we have uh, today. And then it's a popular and known integration platform within Azure, which is commonly used even in security scenarios, like Microsoft Defender for Cloud uses Azure Logic Ops to run workbooks and to do a monitoring in the entire uh, cloud infrastructure. So uh, this is probably basic to most of you since you've worked with this. So the workflow and parts of the Logic App has triggers, actions, and the different connectors and a lot more features. I will not deep dive on this uh, since we're out of time, but there are different connectors as you probably have, some of you have worked on before. And also, of course, our very own serverless 360. I found it earlier that they also have their, their own uh, connector for logic apps, uh, Power Automate, as well as uh, Power Apps. So Logic Apps allows us to integrate in different uh, services, such as, uh, such as Azure Functions, Service Bus, Cognitive Services, as well as on-prem uh, uh, integration with BizTalks and SQL, SharePoint, and you, you see all of those uh, great things. So now focusing on the two things, Azure Logic Apps, you see the, the image here and then Azure Functions. So de uh, going deeper into Azure Functions, uh, as you know, there's the standard Azure Functions, and then there's also the extension of Azure Functions called uh, Durable Functions, which we will be learning more uh, in this session. So when it comes to Logic Apps and Azure Functions, uh, in the Logic App, you can call an HTTP trigger as an action there. But then, now that I've heard a lot of things in the previous session, uh, it's interesting to, do, to try the .NET custom co uh, code, uh, of course. So when it comes to uh, developer and DevOps workflow, so here are the, dev the flow. You make a change in the Azure Dev environment. You download the definition. Uh, review the parameters, and then you commit, and then you do the pipelines. Another scenario that you can use um, multi-cloud, uh, I mean, Azure Logic Apps for multi-cloud or hybrid scenarios is integrating uh, applications like Azure Spring Apps through uh, Logic Apps. You have the workflow that connects your uh, SQL server and SharePoint server with the help of on-prem database, uh, on-prem data gateway, which are connecting or communicating to on-prem. Another example is uh, data integration uh, in terms of an API management in Azure is uh, receiving these requests and then API management is integrated with uh, Logic Apps. And then in the Logic Apps workflow, it does two things. It's a uh, check on the authentication or security through the Azure Key Vault. And then it also uh, connects or save those data to uh, an SQL server on-prem through the on-premise data gateway. And then the SQL, uh, data, I mean the data saved on the server is viewed to the user. And then on this number six here, Azure Monitor, that's the monitoring for, for a log logic, I mean uh, logs and, and what's going on in the entire uh, workflow. So some of you mentioned that you worked with Azure Functions. Is it uh, standard functions or durable functions? Double the dual. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, there is uh, like different use case uh, for that, so it really depends. But as mentioned, uh, durable functions is the extension of um, 
Azure Functions, and it allows us to create stateful workflows just like uh, Azure Logic App as well. Um, state management, that's one of the key features of Azure Durable Functions because uh, you don't have to worry about the state. Uh, so it keeps the state uh, and it manages the state for you. And then the reason behind that, it's because of the durable uh, task framework uh, behind, which is an open source uh, like uh, framework um, in, that you can look it up on, on GitHub as well. And it's also a very diverse type of technology because you can code it with C Sharp, Python, Java if you want, uh, JavaScript, uh, TypeScript, and even uh, PowerShell. So stateful versus stateless. In, in the world of durable functions, this is how you picture it. So in the left, you see that the orchestrator keep it stateful. Uh, you have control over it. And then the right, you see stateless. Uh, that means that there's no orchestrator. Each individual Azure functions that you see here can lose its state, especially if the, uh, the, the virtual, uh, logical virtual machine behind it that's provisioning it get re restarted. So you don't have uh, control for that. So this is where we see the difference of that. And when I think about the orchestrator, I think about this Philippine folk dance called Tinikling. So I have an association to the Philippines because I grew up in the Philippines and then I moved to Sweden. But this is the dance, the traditional dance look like. So you see the synchronization and orchestration between the members of this dance group that they need to synchronize and orchestrate in order to deliver uh, the dance. If one of them fails or maybe lose uh, lose the bamboo stick, then everything does it, doesn't work synchronously or stateful, keep stateful and keep everyone happy through this dance. Yes, so that's Tinikling. So you learned a bit of uh, Philippine culture in London from a Swedish woman. <laughs> yes, yeah, so durable functions type. So before you can get started developing with durable functions, you need to know the different types because this is like the part of the entire like authoring of the workflow. So first, we have client functions. And these are the functions that are starter functions. They can be an HTTP trigger, an IoT hub trigger, or a Cosmos DB trigger. There's like the starting point. And the next one is the orchestrator functions. Orchestrator functions, this is like the heart of durable functions. This is where you write or author your workflow in your preferred language, of course. And then in this orchestrator functions, this is where you develop what kind of uh, patterns, design patterns that you're going to be using or combine together in order to solve uh, different kinds of use case or scenarios. And then the next type is the activity functions. They are actually like small unit of tasks or activities that you perform and that gets triggered through your, through your logic in the orchestrator function. So this can be like uh, send an email or save a queue message to a service bus and other activities that you need to do. And then there's also durable entities for entity functions, which is commonly used for .NET. And this is to make the, uh, the, this, to make the entities of, uh, of the .NET uh, like, uh, objects uh, stateful, which is, itself is a very broad topic in uh, .NET development with Azure functions. But I won't deep dive on that uh, specifically today. So, Speaking about orchestrator, so orchestrator is very special because this is where we write our workflow, our design patterns for, for any language that you prefer. But there's a strict rule there. 
It needs to be deterministic. Why is that? It's because the entire workflow will be replayed every time it gets uh, triggered. So when we design, or not design, but when we write or author the workflow, uh, we need to think about deterministic rule, and that's because it will be uh, replayed. So in terms of like examples, this is in .NET. So the red that you see here in the left are actually the don'ts. And then to the right, I'm actually reversing the, <laughs> the label there. But to the right, uh, that's actually the do's. So for example, uh, generating GUIDs or random numbers in the orchestrator are not recommended. Uh, like configurations or database uh, strings uh, should be passed into an activity function or retrieved from there. Blocking API calls like sleep, runs, or uh, thread, for example. And most especially, infinite loops uh, in the orchestrator because it will be replayed. So if you are on a consumption type of Azure functions, can you imagine looping through uh, activities that you kind of run and then it's going to be endless or unlimited or bottomless bill <laughs> that comes up in your subscription. But, uh, but there's a solution for that. If you need to repeat the process within the orchestration, what you can do is through the durable orchestration context, you can call the method create as new as well. And then, of course, daytime. It breaks the rule because the time keeps ticking every millisecond. But then through the durable context, there's a method called current U to C daytime. This is in uh, .NET, but there's a specific one for uh, different languages. You can use that within the orchestration. So patterns. So there are actually six documented patterns for durable functions. And you might be wondering, what are the purpose of patterns. Just like uh, any solution for any architecture, sometimes you have to think about different application patterns. And the common one for this uh, technology, uh, there are six. So we have uh, function chaining. There's fan out, fan in. There's the async HTTP API. There's the monitor pattern. Uh, there's the human interaction pattern, and then there's also the aggregator pattern. So these patterns, you can combine them. You can use each or combine one or two or different uh, patterns, depending on what you're trying to solve, and that's what we will go through together. So function chaining, it's pretty obvious. It's like a chain of functions or activity that you're going to execute in a particular order. And there are certain use cases that this is uh, pretty useful to, to have if you have a sequence of things that you need to do that requires input from the previous function, which is F1 is fit function 1, F2 is function 2, that you can pass in in, in sequence. And one example, simple example that I have here uh, in integrating uh, durable functions with this pattern is, like for example, you have an Azure storage, and then you uploaded a blob, which can be an image from your application. When you upload that blob image through your app, through a button click, that event actually can kickstart the orchestration. And then you can choose to pass in any data that you want. It can be a blob image data and grab anything that's important from it. And then what you can do, you can have like an example series of like uh, activities. Like let's say uh, you need to send uh, the URL of that blob image to a service bus, which you can then later on pass into another application, or maybe you want to notify someone. So this is our example of sending a message to the service bus function, or you can 
uh, send an SMS or make a call using Twilio API. Or you can also use SendGrid as well in, uh, in, in this type of chain. So function chaining in action actually looks like this. Let's just say you have a few activities. So when you have, let's, let's just say you have a trigger, uh, a data saved in a Cosmos DB trigger, the orchestration gets started. So when your activity starts doing its thing, the orchestrator sleeps. And then when activity one is done, uh, the orchestrator wakes up. Activity two is scheduled doing its thing. The orchestrator sleeps again. Activity two is done. And then the orchestrator orchestration is completed. This is just very simple if you only have like two small activities. But then when it gets triggered again, like a new data comes in into your Cosmos DB, for example, it will be replayed and the entire workflow will be like, will be happening again. So the orchestrator can be a sleepy head, like my dog sometimes, but it's good, good for us because it will help us save some money or some cost because we do have control on what's going on in your orchestration or your uh, workflow. So that's function chaining and also orchestrator that applies to all functions. It helps us uh, take control and also save some costs, of course. So the next pattern is the fan out, fan in, which allows us to execute multiple functions in parallel and then wait for all those parallel tasks to finish and then you aggregate the result uh, and process it farther. And this is a good pattern that is good to have and also difficult to achieve if you have a stateless type of uh, functions. So by doing this, you do have control on the state of all the parallel tasks that you need to run at the same time and then you can process it. So in this example, um, since, uh, since we're speaking about patterns, I want to see a snippet of fan out, fan in uh, from the Microsoft Docs example, in which here you see a function name, a function that's called fan out, fan in, and what it does, it actually uh, loops through the parallel task uh, for this specific function, and then what it does in every parallel task that you have, it calls the next function, which is called F2, and then it passed in the parameter called work batch, and then it's saving it into a list of objects uh, by adding it, and then it aggregates it using the keyword or the function when all, and then it processes it farther by calling function uh, three in here and then pass in the sum. The next pattern is uh, async HTTP API. I lost, what happened? Wait. There, what, what? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right. Maybe you lost uh, the syncing there. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, so the next pattern is the async HTTP API, which is actually, very useful uh, if you're trying to like uh, doing uh, uh, long running operations for external clients in like, like for example, calling an endpoint uh, that you want to be stateful. So here is just an example, like uh, let's just say you're trying to check if a website is available, but this could be like an endpoint that you're trying to call. And the main keyword in this code snippet uh, is that the durable HTTP response, which creates uh, an instance, and then you can use the, uh, the, the function called call HTTP a sync method, passed in the type, of, uh, the type of method that you want. It can be get, post, or put, and then you passed in your URL, or it could be your uh, endpoint. 
And then from there, when you get the response, depending on the result of that HTTP uh, request or response, you're going to process it farther and do your uh, logic uh, from there. And the key point here is that it's stateful. And uh, it makes, that's why it's called durable, <laughs> of course. Uh, next pattern uh, that's good to know is the monitoring pattern. And this is good if you're trying to to have a process or monitoring that you want to be stateful until a specific condition is met, like, like monitoring a job status. Like in here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an expiration time and a pulling interval. And in your loop, you're trying to loop through the expiration time. And then when the job is completed, it's going to send an alert. Otherwise, until the next check, based on your pulling interval here, it's gonna sleep. The orchestrator will sleep, and then you won't be able, you won't you won't have to worry about the cost because the orchestrator is sleeping, and then it won't do its tasks or instance create the instances of the workflow until uh, it is uh, done. The next pattern that I find also myself interesting is the human interaction pattern. And this pattern is very good if you are trying to create a workflow or orchestration that requires human uh, interaction. So the typical like process is like approval process, for example, in an application where, let's just say, you have a, uh, you need a uh, um, a document approved by someone, but then that person maybe is on vacation. So in your automated process using durable functions, you can uh, have a durable timer on the side uh, along with the human interaction that's waiting for an internal event. And based on that, it's going to process the 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 things that it needs to approve or it's gonna escalate based on the durable timer so in by, by code uh, in c sharp for example you have a function name called approval workflow and then what it does is it's waiting for a request approval and you do have a timeout here which is called the durable timeout and you're setting here uh, so you can see add hours for 72 hours, you're doing the durable timeout. And there's an if else condition that any of this event happens, like external event from a person clicking a button or whatever, like responding to an SMS or calling. Uh, it's going to wait for external event, but if nothing happens between, I mean, in 72 hours, it will escalate. So it's going to call the function called escalate. And then you can choose if you want to pass in like data or parameters to process further by calling another functions uh, in there. So that's the human interaction. Very useful if you, you want to take control of the process. If maybe Jonah is in integrate and speaking and she cannot work, <laughs> Someone, the, the durable timer can, uh, can fix it. So the last pattern is the aggregator pattern. As mentioned, I added a, uh, a QR code here so you can like look into it, especially if you're a .NET developer and curious about it. But uh, what it does is that it's special. It's called aggregator pattern because what it does is that it's stateful, of course, it aggregates the event data uh, over like a time period. And then this data is actually coming from different resources, data resources, and they can come anytime. In a stateless functions or workflow, it's not easy to capture those data coming from different uh, resources. So the aggregator pattern are very useful, uh, especially in like, as we see here, an example, a trigger from Event Hub using C Sharp that you can actually uh, use uh, with stateful entities in, in .NET. So those are the six patterns. 
there's like six, but uh, you can also create sub orchestrations in an orchestration, like uh, a few of them or more. And currently, as far as I know, it's supported in .NET, uh, JavaScript, and Python. But this is very useful if you have you want to organize all your activities uh, in different sections or categories. And one key thing here that you need to remember is that it must be defined in the same function as the parent, as you can, you can see here. So this sub orchestrator one that you see in top, it could be something that a group of activities that you wanna perform for a specific use case or like things that you need to do in your application or integration. So in this example, C Sharp, so what in this one is like, it's trying to uh, list down the devices and IoT devices, and it's gonna provision each device in all those lists, and then it's gonna pass in the device ID, it's gonna uh, save it in a list of string, and then it's combining the uh, the aggregator, the fan out, fan in part of it. And the key thing that, let me see if I can press hit that. No, I cannot reach there. But the, you see there is, oh, there is this uh, method through the orchestration context called call sub orchestrator async. So that's the keyword. It's trying to call a sub orchestrator. And this is just one example, very simple one. You can have, you can call as many sub orchestration uh, through the context uh, as well. And did you know that you can also do forever orchestration uh, in a way that, uh, you can, it's called eternal <laughs> orchestration, so it can live longer than us. But uh, what, you can, what you can do is that you can uh, have this uh, static instance ID that you wanna specifically run eternally. And then uh, through the client, you start the instance of that orchestration by passing in the ID and then what you can do is you can uh, check uh, the response of that, and then it runs. But you might be wondering, how can I kill it? If I wanna kill it, or if there's something wrong. Uh, behind the scenes in each Azure uh, durable functions, uh, there's, or Azure functions itself, there is actu it's actually associated with web jobs and Azure storage. And there you do have properties like instance ID and the termination URL if you want to terminate it or if you want to do a retry. So these things you can actually control uh, by code uh, uh, using the instance ID. Of course, the tools like Azure Storage and other uh, web job logs that you can actually access locally if you're developing locally or through the Azure uh, portal. So if you're developing, there are a lot of vi variations, uh, different ways to develop it. You can do it in Azure portal, uh, work locally using Visual Studio or VS Code, any ID IDE that's supported in your preferred language, which can be C Sharp, Java, or PowerShell. And then you need to have the latest Azure function core tools and there are tools like REST client, Postman. There's a local uh, logging also. Uh, if you're working locally, uh, there's Azureite that you can use uh, as well. And there's one key thing here also that I wanna share. If you're creating Azure functions in the Azure portal, you cannot edit or continue working it in the Visual Studio because like, if you're created it in Azure for portal, then you need to work on the Azure portal. Otherwise, you, you work it locally and then you publish it uh, your way. And then creating resources, you can create it in infrastructure as code in any way that uh, you want as well. Best practices, so uh, there are things to think about, monitoring of course. One common challenge that I often hear from others is the cold start problems. 
in Azure Functions. And that can be solved uh, different ways, but one of the solutions that others suggest is to use the premium uh, pricing tier of Azure Functions instead. Conscious versioning, side-by-side -side deployment, and also making use of the different tools like um, in terms of updating the production code is using the uh, deployment slots and also in terms of security to use Azure Key Vault and, and manage identities uh, that suits your uh, Jira the function itself. In .NET, when you develop it, you need to choose between isolated or in process. The standard one is in process, but then I think in .NET 6, 7, and the upcoming 8, uh, the isolated process is supported. That's because of different reasons, and one of them is for, uh, for dependency injection and other uh, good features and benefits uh, of it. Error handling, uh, of course, the typical uh, error handling that we do as a developer. Uh, there's also a way to handle problems, like what you can do is you can call another function uh, and do a retry. Uh, there's also an automatic retry on failure that you can pass in some parameters. How often do you want to retry? How long do you want to retry? So this call activity with retry as sync is asynchronous and it will retry your orchestration in case something uh, fails. Uh, and then you can do uh, logging through App Insights. And then the durable timers are very useful in terms of tracking or taking control on, wh on what happens, especially in that human interaction pattern that we saw. So a lot of Azure solutions uh, solve problems. Um, so one of the things that I like developing with Azure functions or serverless in general, uh, both Azure functions and, and event-driven services in Azure is this kit or one of my gadget that I work with. It's the Azure IoT Dev Kit. So working with IoT development is a good way to learn event-driven type of uh, workflows, and this is something that I recommend. So when you have it, for example, you can uh, build it with these tools, like you use CMake to build, and then uh, ARM GCC to compile, and then Termite to monitor the serial port of that connected device. And then you can integrate it with serverless or PaaS or SaaS services within Azure, like Azure Event Grid, Azure Functions, Logic Up, and there's a lot, a lot more actually uh, that you can uh, you can try with it. So I'm not sure if I have time for demo. I think uh, we're delayed for 20 minutes for a while, so I'm gonna skip the demo. Um, but I want to share with you that um, going back to Logic Apps, uh, there's this good example that I saw online, I'm not sure if this is uh, still updated, but uh, if you wanna do like DevOps pipeline orchestration with Azure Logic App, uh, that's also uh, available by scanning this QR code. And then my key takeaway or our key takeaway, when to choose the right one. I know maybe some, of, most of you already have been using this two already or combining them, but there are factors that are to think about when you're trying to decide when to use durable functions over Azure logic apps and factors such as like development, monitoring, actions, the things that you need to do, the connectivity, the execution context or management, there are things that you can consider when you're uh, building it, especially for the first time. Because once you have built it already, when it's in production, it will be not easy to, to change it later on. So th the first steps is trying to decide uh, which is best. And of course, it's always good to keep ourselves updated, just like, 
the Astrologic Ops team, fellow speakers sharing the, the, the latest updates about these technologies. But the highlight in terms of development is that durable functions is focused on code first, so it's imperative. And then the Astrologic Ops is declarative. And both of this are very powerful uh, tools for stateful workflows, especially the Azure Logic Ops, because it integrates to a lot of things uh, within Azure, and uh, especially for uh, SaaS and B2B uh, use cases. And so think about it, and uh, there are uh, different ways, uh, and you choose the right one that fits your solution. I'm a senior, cons I'm a consultant, so I often say that what, whatever is the use case scenario, it really depends on the problem that we're trying to solve. If you have a problem that requires you to integrate with B2B scenarios or like designer first or de declarative because your team members are not familiar coding C Sharp or JavaScript or PowerShell, then I would recommend Logic Apps. But if your team development team are like all, like prefer the code first, then durable functions might be also uh, worth considering. So uh, recommended resources, uh, Azure Functions, if you want to learn more about it, uh, especially the durable functions. I see some are taking pictures, so I'm going to take a moment. And uh, other learning resources like durable functions, Azure Logic Ops, those are like the documentation links to all of them, including uh, .NET. And there's also the Logic Ops extension that probably most of you have uh, started uh, using uh, as well in VS Code. Yeah, so... Um, Solve problems and develop by automating workflows using serverless technologies if possible. And it can be any way. Uh, you can, I like this like theme that work less with cloud and serverless, either with code, low code, or maybe uh, use uh, both of them. So thank you so much, and if you are curious about what I do, I actually wrote about Azure Compute and serverless uh, in a few chapters of my book, and I think some of you grabbed a few of my bookmarks already. So if you have questions related to Azure or like the topic that I'm talking today, feel free to reach out uh, to me anytime. And with that, I want to thank you for your time today and connect with me through LinkedIn or Twitter by scanning this QR code. And this is my dog, Lawrence, waiting for me in Sweden. So he's a labradoodle. So he's also saying thank you in behalf of me. Thank you so much. <laughs>